Hello, I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Going to be speaking with Dr. Michael Dugan this evening. He's um, working at Massachusetts General Hospital, and he's joining us to talk about some research presented at the Digestive Disease Week, or DDW 2020. Welcome to the program, Dr. Dugan. Well, thank you for having me. So I really um, I like having the chance to, to talk a little bit about this research. Uh, and I'll start maybe by talking about where it came from and uh, and then get to the actual findings, if that is all right with you. Absolutely. So uh, my interest is really in how the immune system controls itself in our gut. And you know, there's a lot of complexity to that process, as I'm sure many of the listeners know, because the immune system both has to fight off infections that get in through our digestive tract, one of the most common places that infections get into our body, but at the same time has to be able to tell that all the food that we're eating and all of the normal bacteria that live there is harmless. And that decision between harmless and harmful is actually a very complicated one that's governed by a lot of different cells and a lot of different proteins. And we have a reasonably good idea of what the major players are, but we haven't really historically had any way to, to test in adults uh, what the role of any given cell type or any given protein is. And uh, that really changed about 10 years ago when oncology started using a variety of different medications to manipulate the immune system to treat cancer. And uh, these drugs are fantastic, have led to many, many people being cancer-free for years mm -hmm. after treatment, but they also have done a lot of uh, damage to the immune system in multiple parts of the body, including in the gut. Okay. And uh, that kind of damage actually teaches us what the immune system was supposed to be doing. And just as a, an example, if you take the very, um, the very commonly used medications that block a protein called PD-1, when you block PD-1 and you get a bunch of side effects from it in a person, that's telling you what PD-1 was doing in that person before you gave them the drug. Does that make sense as a concept to you? Absolutely, yes, yes. So what my research is is really understanding the mechanisms of the toxicities that come from these mechanisms, mm -hmm. really studying what changes in the gut when you give someone these medicines, and using that as a lesson for understanding the immune system in uh, really you know, throughout the GI tract. And so the presentation uh, that my group is giving at DDW is about celiac disease, mm -hmm. and that's an immune response to the dietary protein gluten. And what we found is that a small number of people, uh, less than 1%, in fact, but, are, but still uh, a, a reasonably clinically significant number of people who get these medications for cancer wind up with newly uh, emergent celiac disease. So they didn't, at least they didn't know they had celiac disease before. And then all of a sudden, over a course of a couple of days, they get really sick and wind up having an immune response to gluten. And uh, what's interesting to me about this is, first of all, you, know, you can identify these people. They actually don't need to stop their cancer therapy. So they start out really sick, the kind of people who might stop their cancer therapy, and that would lead to the cancer starting to grow again. Um, but instead, we find out that they have an immune response to gluten. If they go gluten-free, they can stay on their cancer therapy, which is an amazing benefit to be able to give to those patients. It also tells us a little bit about celiac disease. And that's because if... Um, if you can cause celiac disease by blocking PD-1 by giving these drugs, mm -hmm. it tells you that at least in some fraction of the population, this one protein, PD-1, is actually what's preventing them from having cel celiac disease in the first place. Now, when it comes to, to celiac, do people who have it without these uh, PD-1 inhibitors who just get it you know, by, by whatever other means causes celiac, that's a lifetime thing, is it not? It is a lifetime thing, yes, at least from what we understand. Now, is it the same when someone develops celiac as a result of these PD-1 inhibitors? Yeah, so that's a fantastic question, and uh, the answer is we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. And that's really because these drugs are pretty new. Okay. And so yeah. you know, the PD-1 inhibitors were approved in 2015. And so what I have seen is some people clearly uh, – at least for months or years after stopping the drugs, still 
have uh, symptoms of gluten intolerance. We have not gone back and done repeat biopsies to show that those people still have celiac disease, mm -hmm. really because if they're, if they're still symptomatic, they might as well stay away from gluten, and I don't want to put them through any extra procedures. Mm -hmm. But we have had a few people who really seem to stop having symptoms and um, seem to get better over time. So it's possible this is not permanent in, in the setting of PD-1 blockade. Now, the dietary restrictions that go along with celiac, are they identical? Yes. Uh, from I mean, there, there's a little bit of uh, sort of tautology there. I mean, I, we define it as celiac disease, and so we give them the celiac dietary recommendations. Mm -hmm. If there were hundreds or thousands of people like this, we could explore whether or not the, the dietary restrictions really have to be the same. But what we've done, because it's a small number, is um, in, in our hospital, something like 10 people uh, have, have gone through this. In that population, we just give them the same dietary guidelines that we give to people who have uh, spontaneous or regular celiac disease. And we found that they respond to that and so have not uh, explored any subtle distinctions in that, in that way yet. Is this complication seen in cancers across the board, cancer immunotherapy across the board, or in specific cancer immunotherapies and specific drugs? So right now, it, I don't know if there's a difference in, um, say, a subtle difference in drugs, like say if mm -hmm. one drug is twice as likely or 50% more likely to cause it than another. I know that all of the drugs can cause it. So we've seen it uh, with every different kind of or class of immunotherapy that's been approved. But um, again, don't have the numbers to be able to say if there are distinctions in relative risk among them. Is there some place where we can learn more about the connection between PD-1 inhibitors and celiac disease and um, learn more about the type of candidates who are uh, susceptible? So the this is really emerging information. So there's really uh, essentially nothing in the published literature. Okay. Okay. The, um, the paper that's describing this is likely to be published soon, but right now the only thing that's out there is this uh, DDW presentation. So it is um, at the forefront of what we understand. I hope to have more to tell you uh, in the next months to years as we set up collaborations among different institutions, and that will give us a larger number of people to be able to study. Well, thank you so much for coming in and, and speaking with us. We'd like to have a website where we can go and learn more about Digestive Disease Week uh, 2020 www.ddw.org. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, in conversation with Dr. Michael Dugan. Audio copies of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au.